A warm welcome to you all. You have been invited to our commemoration meeting of the Wadston Hill Strict Baptists. Please join us after the meeting at the Bell Hotel to renew acquaintances and ask questions. You don't have to be a strict Baptist to come here, just be yourself. Unfortunately, there's no toilet, so we'll make things quick and maybe next year we'll have a portable loo. This building has been looked after very well by its new owners, the Friend of Friendless Churches. It's a delight to see it kept so well, so we thank you all, those that have been involved. It was built on the hill for all to see, I'm sure. The original people who met here for worship were called Calvinistic dissenters. They were particular Baptists. The chapel or church was formed in 1792 by Francis Cox. To be a dissenter meant that they came out of the Church of England. They were particular Baptists, which meant they baptised believers on confession of their faith and did not believe in the Ang Anglican practice of infant baptism. And being Calvinist meant they believed in the atonement. The atonement made by Jesus was definite, was particular and for those chosen in Christ before the world was. I am the last surviving member of Beaton Strict and Particular Baptists and we, like Watson Hill, were Gospel Standard Baptists. Beaton is a small village near Aylesbury. I remain the last member by default as our church rules stipulate that only the church can terminate one's membership either by an honourable transfer to another church of the same faith and order or by a dishonourable dismissal. In my case I seceded from the church over matters of conscience. My membership was never terminated by the church. We commemorate the Watson Hill Church for being faithful in preserving the gospel truths of our Lord Jesus Christ, especially the truths of particular redemption. Now my qualifications to express such gratitude is due to my own testimony of conversion from crime to Christ and how the truths of particular redemption strengthen and encourage me in the way of following Christ. Now, my method is to tell my story, and to do so I wish to tell of my conversion from crime to Christ, to tell of my previous history, to, have, to tell how the Lord saved me and delivered me for a life of crime and certain further imprisonment. I want to tell how I turned my life around and about those truths relating to salvation that gave me courage and strength and confidence all of which truths was the Hill Strict and Particular Baptist stood for. We start with my history. I was born in Oldham, Lancashire in 1949, and I have a brother, older than me, born in 1946, who died sadly of tuberculosis in prison in the Philippines in 2005. In my early years in Oldham, I recall going to church with my mother, and drawing pictures, also falling asleep during those soporific sermons. I must have been four years old. We moved to Watford when I was about six years old. Uh, I was very young, but I got into mischief. My mother also took me to Sunday school or church at the age of 11 years old. We went to a congregational church in North Watford. And I can remember the Easter story used to be told every year. And I wondered then, why didn't Jesus get down from the cross and confound all his enemies? Because I believed he could have done. I can also recall stealing money and three pounds from my mother's purse so I could go to the fair. Also stealing radio equipment, for that was my hobby. I felt guilty about stealing the money from my parents, but I was a thief and so was my brother. Later, we moved to Wilston in 1982 from Watford to the village store and it wasn't long there before I got into trouble again. I stole a shotgun from a farmer and had to amuse myself with my hobby, learning electronics and radio stuff. Michael, however, got in trouble with the police. He got sent to detention centre for hitting a boy with a knuckle duster that he'd made at school. And on his release from... Uh, Oxford Detention Centre, 
He assaulted a policeman in Tring and got sent to detention centre again. Now, we then moved to Aylesbury in 1963 because Mum found village life difficult, particularly with Michael getting into trouble with the police and so on. And it was here I also got into trouble, stealing bicycles and motorbikes, and I was put on probation for garage braking. It was about this time, at school, the last year of school, I got a Saturday job at, with Mr Knight at Central Bucks TV, learning to be an electronics technician, or what we called radio and television servicing. And I met his wife, Mrs Knight. She was a Christian. The trouble was, she expressed to me that my lifestyle was wrong, and all those things that I found fun and good, according to her, were sinful. I thought she was mad. You see, I was in a rock group and wanted to explore promiscuity uh, and crime, and I had no concern about others or fear of God at all. Michael was soon sent to Borstal again, uh, and I got my first girlfriend. Uh, I inherited his bro my brother's scooter, a Lambretta, and I went to the Saturday, Saturday dance uh, one, one evening in Aylesbury, and that's where I met my first girlfriend. I also met the lads in Aylesbury and they all knew my brother and because of that I was accepted by them all. They were mods. My first real girlfriend I met when I was 16 and I fell in love at the Aylesbury College dance. But it didn't last and she finished with me because I had no prospects of getting on. She was a high school girl, I was a secondary modern graduate with no education and a thief. When Michael was released from Borstal I found it hard to face life without my girlfriend and I didn't want any other girl. I began to use girl for sex only and didn't want a relationship after that. When Michael came out of Borstal we teamed up together but we were soon arrested getting in trouble with the police uh, for using an egg and taking pot shots at people as we passed through London on their way to Margate one bank holiday. We were arrested for malicious wounding and carrying a firearm without a licence. I was sent to Dover Borstal and Michael to Mayston Prison. And during my time in Borstal, I mocked at all religion. I thought people who had religion were sissies, couldn't stand on their own two feet. On my release from Borstal, I had a three year career of undetected crime. I met up again with Mrs. Knight and found her religious views totally against what I wanted. I wanted the life of sex, drugs, crime, you name it. All those things that she told me were wrong, it was my lifestyle. I came to the conclusion religion was for people who were sissies and could not stand on the road two feet and how could and I thought how could people enjoy life without getting up to the things I got up to. On the 16th of January 1970 I had a bad trip on LSD and that night, I'd given the drugs to my friend that night, I had to call out to God for help. During my bad trip, I went to Mrs Knight's home seeking some form of refuge. I asked if I could lay down in the sun chalet in their garden at the Knight's home in Mount Street. In my agony, whilst alone in that chalet, I called out to the Lord for help. I said, Jesus, please help me. I then felt guilty of a particular sin of adultery. Mrs Knight came to the chalet door to see if she could help. And I said to her, did she know how bad I was and what could I do? She then quoted the scripture. She said that for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believed in him should not perish but have everlasting life. It was then Jesus spoke to me and said that what I'd been going through was nothing compared to what hell was like. My immediate thoughts were towards my friends and I asked, what about the others? And he said, all I could do was tell them. Now, after that, I wanted you to know the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. I wanted you to know everything about life, the universe, and everything about who the Lord Jesus is and was. I found I did not wish to live the life that I'd lived. I did not have to give up anything. I just did not wish to live the life that I once lived. The next day was Saturday. I told all my friends that I'd given drugs to that night, that included Pat Jones, also Paddy, I then spoke to Mick West and the Knights and all around and they wondered what on earth had happened to me. Next, the following day, Sunday, I was taken to the church at Southport Baptist and met Martin White 
who was a preacher, and he gave me a copy of the New Testament, A Good News for Modern Man. I could hardly read. I was virtually illiterate. The most I had read till the age of 21 was the Dandy and the Beano comics, and also some books by Ian Fleming, such as Dr. No. So I struggled to read the New Testament, but I read it in two weeks. I didn't even know what the Acts of the Apostles meant, but there I read who Jesus was and that he died for my sins. I learned this through my own reading and not in any church. I say this because I went to Rickford Hill before with Mrs Knight and I never heard them tell me why Jesus came into the world or why he died, but it was only after I was converted that I began to hear what was being said. You see, beforehand, I couldn't hear because my ears virtually were closed to listen to the truth. But once I was born again, I had ears to hear. I could hear that they were teaching that Jesus came into the world to save sinners. And that's how I learned why Jesus had to die. I'd answered my own question. You remember when I told you when I was in the Congregational Church, why didn't Jesus get down from the cross and confound all his enemies? Because he could have done so. You see, Jesus died according to the scriptures, to save me from my sins. Now, I had to learn the way of Christian life, and uh, Christians had all kinds of differences of opinion about this, about that. They were divided about baptism, the way you dress. Some spoke of the baptism in the spirit. Some said didn't, there was no such thing. But I was received well at the Assemblies of God Church at Rickfords Hill, even though I dressed sometimes in my overalls when I attended the meetings. On one occasion, one weeknight meeting, I was asked to share a testimony as to what the Lord had done for me that week. And so I told them, decided to tell them about a temptation that I had. You see, I had a car and the problem with my car was the battery had gone flat and the natural thing for me, for me to do before I even believed in the Lord was to go and steal a new one. No, no second thought about it. And the, the thought came to me at this time, to, there's Adam's garage, go down there, nip over the wall, get a new battery, and there you've solved the problem. So I objected to this new, this felt temptation. I felt it was the devil, so I turned on the devil and said, bugger off Satan, and uh, of course he left me, and I didn't yield to that temptation. Now can you imagine me standing there in my overalls at a church meeting saying, bugger off Satan, one kind gentleman, senior man, came to me afterwards and kindly said, that's an inappropriate form of language. But I didn't realise I'd been told off. I mean, I wouldn't use that language now, but that is a fact. It's true. It was about that time that the same man, his name was Cyril Bryan, who gently told me off for using bad language in the church or anywhere, informed me of the value of the authorised King James Version. He was a member of the Trinitarian Bible Society. He told me and showed me how modern versions were unreliable as they omitted certain things that related to the deity of Christ and taught his deity. I realised this was true, and so I adopted and learned to read the King James Version of the Bible from that day. Now this was good, a good move, because learning the English of the Authorised Version not only improved my English, but equipped me to read books by John Bunyan, Calvin, Dr Gill and all the Reformers, for all of them wrote their writings in English using the King James Version. It also trained my mind and prepared me for higher education, for I was then able to go on and become a lecturer and I taught for over 20 years as a lecturer. Um, now, I wasn't interest, uh, impressed by uh, the ideas that men had about how you should dress. I thought you should dress up for church. Well, I wasn't impressed because I knew that God sees you exactly how you are and where you are. You can cover up, dressing your best suit makes no difference. You need a covering of righteousness to stand before God. Men judge by the outward appearance. It's not God to the Lord's eye. Anyway, one Sunday morning, I was with, uh, uh, with Mrs Knight at her home, and several of my friends were outside in the street doing nothing. On a Sunday it was Mickey Clark, Clifford Attlee, Paul Mitchell, and several other lads, and I decided I should take them to church. And I was dressed in my overalls. I said, come on lads, I'm taking you to church. So I persuaded them to come. And we went to Grenville Street uh, Church and I said to these lads, now look, I'm read in the scriptures. When you go to anywhere, you know, take the lowest place. Don't be like the Pharisees and the Sadducees and take the higher seats. 
you take the lower place when you go. So I said to these guys, look, we'll sit on the floor. So we did. We slipped in, joined the meeting, and sat on the floor. And asked the lads to listen. But sure enough, the stewards came up and said, come on, elevated us to sit on chairs right in the front of the, cha of the chapel building. The trouble was, they had the communion service. And of course, it was an open communion you know, church where anybody that believed in the Lord could partake of the bread and the wine. But the thing was, when the communion cup, the bread and the wine was passed around, they passed us by and circulated this amongst the believers there. Now I felt a bit miffed at that because they again were judging by the outward appearance. They didn't know who we were or, or because we were dressed. We didn't dress like Christians. Never mind, I've written about that in my book. Now I knew at that time from reading the scriptures that I should be baptised. Now, the Bible says that, you know, the, the apostles were commanded to go commanding people to be baptised. When believers, or when, when we get converts, command them to be baptised. Nobody commanded me to be baptised. I was a bit disappointed with that, so I went on my own way and thought, well, I'll get baptised somehow. Now, I went to the Fleet Street Pentecostal Church and asked Pastor to Bruce there, I said, look, could you please baptise me? And amongst his new converts, they included me. And we went to Lions Avenue Baptist Church early in the morning, one Sunday, and uh, I was baptised uh, in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, or Holy Ghost, in that pool there. And my friends came along and witnessed that uh, baptism. It was now I realised I had to learn to read. So, and I learned to read the Gospel. I learned the Gospel through reading the Bible and a range of Christian literature, and listening to Christians talk. Now at that time, <clears throat> I had a load of stolen goods in my possession, but I felt it wrong to use them all, and I couldn't dispose of them. I had cars, speedboat engines, television sets, a builder's shed, test equipment, spray guns, compressors, and so on. I swapped a colour TV set, which I'd stolen from Redfield's old people's home in Winslow, for a Citroen DS car that was now in my garage, had been repaired. It was the one that, the shed was the one that I'd stolen from Burke Hampstead. Now, remember, when I was first converted, I told Mick West all about my experience. He'd, he'd got the colour TV set for me, we'd done the deal. He heard my conversation, and, com of, uh, and he was terrified that I was going to go to the police at the time. Anyway, I couldn't use the goods, so I gave the car back to him. However, nine months later, one of his enemies told the police he got a stolen, stolen TV set. And when the police came to see me about it, I used the occasion to tell them all about my stolen gear. And that's why I went to court and the newspaper headlines reported why he confessed to 24 crimes and converted on LSD trip was the headline. I met at that time a range of Christian believers, all had differing opinions and beliefs, and some contrary one to another. So I studied the scriptures and Christian literature for myself. I needed to know. I couldn't rely upon what people thought or opinions of other people. I soon realised that the truth I began to believe were at odds with many professing Christians. I was told by Tommy Thompson that I was a Calvinist and soon realised the difference between Calvinism and Arminianism. I learned that I stood before God and was viewed by him as a righteous man because of what Jesus had done for me, his righteousness, that's justification. I also learned of predestination. I learned that God was sovereign over all his works of creation and salvation and nothing comes to pass in our lives without good reason and that all things work together for good to them that love God and are called according to his purposes. It was at the time of the hippie movement, and there was a movement amongst young believers who were, they went around with stickers saying, Smile, God loves you. I felt this inappropriate, for I knew the scriptures clearly taught that God did not love everybody the same. For example, it was written, Jacob have I loved, Esau have I hated. It would have been more appropriate or accurate to say or put onto the sticker, God is ang angry with the wicked all day. And so I needed to educate myself in all these things. 
I then spent three years reading and learning what the Bible actually taught and gradually I began to see the greatness and wonder of God's grace in all those attributes that glorify God in the work of saving sinners from themselves through the work and person of our Lord Jesus Christ. I read all about God's word, his names and perfections. And Calvinists believe Jesus died in particular for his people, whereas I'm meaning to believe Jesus died for everybody. So what I did was I um, began to read the scriptures and, if you like, educate myself. I learned the great truths of the gospel. I learned about God and his word, his names and perfections, about the acts of God and the works of God, both internal and external, the acts of grace towards and upon the elect in time, the grace of Christ and his humiliation, exaltation and his offices and the exercise of them, the blessings of grace, the doctrines of grace, the final state of man and the end of the Jewish age. All these truths brought great light to me and I began to see the greatness of God as displayed in these truths, in the whole counsel of God. And these were the doctrines of grace that I embraced. It was then I joined the Beaton Strict and Particular Baptist Church because their articles of religion taught these things. And of course Beaton Church were friends with uh, Waddeston's particular Baptist Church. We were both gospel standard causes. It was there. I was called to preach and sent by the church and preached in many churches throughout England at that time. Life as a believer is not always easy. I had troubles and difficulties and they are the normal thing. However, despite the troubles, trials and difficulties that I met with, my failings and my falls, the Lord hath delivered me out of them all. And all those hurtful and harmful things I experienced and also caused others. I'm going to jump forward in time now to 1996. I was working at college. Remember, I haven't told you yet, but I graduated later. I educated myself, went off to higher education. I graduated in 1978 with a certificate in ed education awarded by Birmingham, Birmingham University in 1978 and taught electronics for many years. And in 1996, I heard on a news broadcast on ITN News that my brother Michael had been arrested in the Philippines and sentenced to 16 years prison term. I was shocked and horrified and felt he was stupid and served him right for his actions. I felt no mercy towards him and did not know but I didn't I did not know the crime but I did knew he was up to no good. I knew he'd been involved in promoting the sex trade in the Philippines and I'd warned him of his wayward, wayward ways before he went, but he ignored me. He'd got what was coming to him. When I got that news, it was then I felt compelled that I should write my story and I used the headline news of the Bucks Herald newspaper, Converted on LSD Trip, as the title of my book, uh, with a subtitle I was going to be Jacob Have I Loved, Esau have I hated. And this was because I had seen how the Lord had delivered me from a wayward lifestyle but left my brother to himself. However, towards the end of 1990s, the 90s, Michael wrote to me and I heard his protest. He claimed that he was innocent of the charges but I knew he'd been up to no good and I had no ears to hear but he told me he was losing his teeth, he was ill, he was getting thinner, he got no hope for the future, he wanted to die, but he feared death and hell. He felt he could never love or ever be loved again. He was the end of himself. He was really in a bad way, and of course I felt for him. But the good news is, and was, that in 1999 he wrote again, telling me of a great change that had taken place. He'd read C.S. Lewis's book, Mere Christianity, and was convinced that Jesus was the Christ, the Son of the living God. And uh, it was then I wrote back immediately and said, Now look, get one of your inmates that's a believer in that prison and baptise you. And he did. He got baptised in an old oil drum. Michael too, like me, in my early days, began to read the scriptures for himself and various Christian books. And he learned from different groups within the prison 
He soon learned the doctrines of grace and realised the reality of particular redemption, and I was delighted. It was then, in 2001, Gordon Smith and I went on a mission to bring assistance to Michael and to share our story with prisoners in New Billyby Prison. We were impressed at the good work of reformation that was being done among prison prisoners teaching themselves the gospel. I took eight copies of my book to the Philippines, giving copies to the director of the prison, the Under Secretary of Justice, and one book was reserved for the president herself, Gloria Macapel Arroyo. On that mission, Michael and I requested a hundred men to write their testimonies of their conversions from crime to Christ. And it was then we decided to form the first ever teacher training college within a maximum security prison. For the next year, Michael and I, along with Lucas Dangatton, a former inmate, worked on our project. And we published our book, Trojan Warriors, outlining the whole of our vision, along with 66 testimonies of some of Asia's most notorious criminals who had turned from crime to follow Christ. In August 2002, we sent our first Trojan warrior, William Pollock, back to his own city to evangelise Baguio and Benguet provincial jails, and his work continues to this day. Now the point I want to make is that the teaching of God's ways, as taught through the doctrines of grace, were those truths that steered me and my brother through all those difficulties in life that we met. The teaching of particular redemption meant that my sins were actually paid for when Jesus died. All of them, past, present and future. When Jesus cried in his death, it is finished, the price was paid and the debts were dealt with. And so it is for all those chosen in him before the foundation of the world. I knew that I had been chosen to obtain salvation, for the scripture speaks this way and that the Lord Jesus Christ had done all that was necessary for my salvation. It was free, a free gift that I did not deserve. And so it is for all who believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. These were the truths that had helped me and Michael. We were both criminals, had been converted from crime to Christ, and now wish to share this good news with all that we could. We knew with a right understanding of who the Lord Jesus Christ is and a knowledge of the gospel, any person having seen with the eye of faith the perfections of God and his ways in Christ, that person, it does not matter how bad their past, in Christ they are new creatures and sons and daughters of the living God. And if God be for them, who can be against them and prosper? My Conclusions and Recollections My first recollection of Jesus was when I was about nine or ten years old, when sitting in the pew in that congregational church, when he was being crucified. I did not know why he died then, or why he didn't get down from the cross and confound his enemies. I wondered why did he let them crucify him. I learned the answer to this, when I read the scriptures myself at the age of 21 after my conversion. I also recall the dying words of Jesus, again through my own reading of the scriptures. At that time I read these words, however I had no one to tell me what this meant at the time. I have since learned myself it was Jesus telling the future of the destruction of Jerusalem in 70 AD, just 40 years after his death. But Jesus, turning unto them, said, Daughters of Jerusalem, weep not for me, but weep for yourselves and for your children. For behold, the days are coming in the which they shall say, Blessed are the barren, and the wombs that never bear, and the pats which never gave suck. Then shall they begin to say unto the mountain, Fall on us, and to the hills cover us. For if they do these things in the green tree, what shall it be done in the dry? Now, Jesus was foretelling the destruction of Jerusalem for the rejection, their rejection of Jesus. And that's when the Jewish state and the law of Moses and the temple was razed to the ground to make way for the new Jerusalem, which was to descend out of heaven as told in the book of Revelation. 
Now, these be the truths taught here in this chapel since 1792. And for this reason, we can be thankful for the church who once met here and preserved the truths of particular redemption. For this is where the gospel was preached since 1792 to 1976 and now declared again from the housetops this day, the 16th of August 2014. Thanks be to God for his unspeakable gift. Now, to sum up, Watson Hill Particular Baptist taught the doctrines of grace in terms of particular redemption. These are the very truths that gave me direction and support throughout my conversion from crime to Christ. These be the truths that gave my brother the help and direction that he needed when he believed the gospel in New Bilibid Prison. And it was and is our desire to help and train converted criminals to teach these truths on their release from prison when they return to their own cities, towns or villages. This also is the motivation in telling this whole story as a punk rock opera to be performed in prisons in the UK. To encourage converted prisoners in UK prisons with the same truths as these truths will keep them on the straight and narrow and also any who believe on the Lord Jesus Christ.